All right, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Roy, for that presentation. Uh, just in a couple minutes here, we'll get going with our producer panel today. Um, while we're getting set up over here, maybe I'll just do a couple housekeeping rules and a bit of an introduction to the talk. Uh, so if you don't have an agenda in front of you, the, the uh, producer panel today covers the topics of can organic agriculture maintain strong production values as farms get bigger. And I think that's really a trend that we're starting to see on organic farms. Um, in Manitoba, as well as across the prairies, we have two farmers here with us today from Saskatchewan. Uh, I think that's something we're definitely seeing in some of the more western provinces. Uh, so we have about an hour and a half to cover through some interesting topics, and I'm sure there's a lot of people in the room that are quite curious, um, maybe about organic production in general, or how these farmers are operating such large acres. So hopefully we'll get all of your questions answered today. I have a list of questions to get things started. We'll have some time in between each question for people in the room to, to ask a question. And I would ask, um, just for the sake of not stealing my questions, to keep it kind of related to what they're talking about. And then we'll have lots of time at the end if you've come prepared with uh, something that we didn't cover during the talk. Oh, sorry, I'm Catherine. <laughs> Thanks. Um, for those of you who haven't met, my name is Catherine Stanley, and I work as a research associate with Dr. Martin Entz in the Natural Systems Agriculture Lab at the University of Manitoba. Um, so nice to meet you all. And with us today, we have, from my left, we have Stuart McMillan. Uh, many of you may remember him. Uh, he used to be in Manitoba, and he's recently um, left Manitoba to go live in Saskatchewan, which we'll forgive him for. I did the same. Um, and then beside Stuart is Jason Peters, who farms with Poplar Grove Organics. And on my far right is Travis Hyde, who is from, also from Saskatchewan at One Organic Farms. So beyond that, I'm going to open up the questions now and get the producers to introduce themselves. And so my first question is uh, if you three gentlemen, if you're ready. Awesome can briefly describe your operation and why you decided to transition to organic production. And Travis, since your slides are up, you can go first. Um, yeah, we, uh, uh, we left farming. Uh, my parents sold the family farm. We went off and did a number of other things kind of in, in about 2007, six and seven in those years. And uh, we ended up coming back in about 2014. And I mean, anyone who knows what's happened with costs of conventional agriculture uh, through that period um, knows that it's real hard to make the numbers work, especially when you're paying for everything. And uh, you know, we didn't have paid for equipment. We didn't have paid for land. Um, we didn't have a whole bunch of sons that could work on our farm to kind of help you know, support a bunch of the costs. So we were kind of coming back into agriculture with uh, the highest probably cost of production. Um, we tried everything we knew from a conventional standpoint the first year and we just, the numbers just didn't make sense nor did they work and, and we had actually tried an organic experiment uh, that same year so we began the registration of the paperwork um, on uh, a chunk of pasture land and uh, broke that up without the use of any um, uh, herbicides and whatnot. And uh, in 2015, that crop paid for, you know, essentially what we didn't earn on the conventional wheat. And, and uh, we knew there was something there kind of immediately. So it was really a business case. Um, and my, my wife is from um, the Duncan sort of on Vancouver Island. And uh, she definitely has got a strong influence and in another part of the reason why we've chosen to uh, move in the organic direction. And uh, we've had a lot of incredible debates through all of these years of change and transition and we've been to a lot of different talks and we've heard a lot of different sides of this scenario and we just real, really feel strong and passionate that you know a big part of what we're to do on this earth is to show that there's a way to do it without the use of chemical and fertilizer. And that's kind of, you know, what, what's brought us to this point. And uh, we want to believe in and empower people. And uh, we're seeing just all these amazing economic development factors that 
seem to be happening from our leaky bucket that sort of the money falls in the community around us. So I think that's what we're most excited about is just change and the ability to grow clean and healthy food for people. And uh, that's what's brought us to this point. Perfect. Good. All right. Um, like Catherine said, my name is Jason Peters. I'm an agronomist with uh, Quaker Farms down in Winkler. Um, just before I introduce the farm, a little bit about myself. Uh, I started at Quaker's five years ago with zero organic background at all. I had no idea what it was about, uh, but I was definitely curious. And, um, and I tell you, being at Quaker's, uh, you know, it always in intrigued me. You know, how do, they, how do they do all these things, especially potatoes? How do you grow potatoes without without all the crop protection that gets used. And, and that idea kind of, you know, it, it's kind of what drew me in. And over the last five years, I've had the opportunity to, um, not only to work on the farm, but also attend a whole pile of different conferences. Quakers is big on education, uh, education, making sure that, um, that, you know, we're kind of up with the, the latest and also being involved in things like this. And, uh, and so I've really come to enjoy what I do. And it's a privilege to be here today to, uh, to speak to all you guys and to sit on this panel with, uh, with uh, Travis and Stuart. So with that, let's introduce the farm. Uh, Crakers is headquartered in Winkler, uh, Winkler, Manitoba. Uh, we own and rent between, uh, between the two of those, uh, about 20,000 acres is what we have access to. And on a yearly basis, we grow about 5,500 acres of potatoes which include seed potatoes tables, creamers, which are the little baby potatoes, and organic potatoes as well, and then 3,200 acres of organic grain crops. Other than that, we have no other conventional crops, so we make it a practice to trade away uh, our land that is not up for potatoes in the rotation, so that on the conventional side, all we grow is potatoes. So it's, it's really our core business. Uh, the farm itself, we have, we have 12 different divisions. There's four conventional potato divisions, three organic divisions, which is a part of a, a separate company called Poplar Grill Farm. We have an earthworks division, which does um, uh, things like uh, irrigation, um, installing pipe and building reservoirs, and then a service and maintenance department, a packaging plant, and administration. So uh, between our 150 to 200 employees and uh, you know, 100 shareholders, there's, there's definitely a lot, a lot going on at the farm at any given time. Um, just a comment on the shareholders. Uh, most of them are from the original uh, Mr. Craker who started the farm back in the 40s. Uh, they are into the fourth, fifth, and sixth generation now, I think. So the majority of our shareholders are actually off farm, not really connected. Uh, most of them come from more of an urban setting. Um, so more specific to the organic side, Poplar Grove. Uh, there we have 4,500 acres of certified organic land. And you can see that's our approximately our 2019 breakdown of acres, what we're going to plant. And a typical rotation for us, with some variations, is, um, is vegetable in the first year, which would be like a potato or onion, uh, followed by a grain, usually hemp, uh, followed by a green manure. Uh, so why go organic? Uh, they started this conversation back in the mid-90s when I was still in grade school. So I had to go back and ask Marv Dick, who's our kind of resident expert on organics, as to what were they thinking back then. And, uh, and as best as he could remember, we had a group of fourth generation shareholders at the time who were in their 20s and 30s. And they, they seemed to think that this organic thing was going somewhere. And so they brought the idea forward to the farm and said, hey, we want you to check this out. And the farm looked into it, and they, they saw a really good business opportunity when it came to potatoes. Uh, there wasn't a lot of organic spuds around at that time, and, um, and thought they could, uh, they could tap into something there. Um, so they started transitioning their first land in 1998. They started with 40 acres. And uh, the picture you see up there, that's actually the very first truckload of organic uh, reds that they ever harvested off the farm. Um, and they've slowly been growing, so, so their philosophy was let's, let's grow with the market. They could have gotten a lot bigger a lot faster, but, uh, but decided to, to kind of grow with, with the potato market, and, and that's led us to where we are today. So we've got about, like I said before, about 4,500 acres or so. so.
Well, good morning. Um, I'm Stuart McMillan. I'm, I've taken over the role with farm manager for Legend Organic Farms a total of 13 months ago. So it's uh, not speaking from a point of I'll speak to you of what we're doing now and where we've come from, but um, similar to, uh, um, to Travis as well, that really the farm itself is not that old. This is a relatively new venture um, for the farm. So a little bit about our farm background. Um, the farm is actually uh, is owned by the, the founders of Nature's Path, which is the largest organic uh, breakfast and snack food manufacturer in North America. Um, they've, ooh, I think they're selling about 50 different countries around the world. Um, so they are um, a, a firmly, uh, you know, on the processing side um, and, the, and the sort of the retail shelf, a fairly significant organic brand. And uh, the founder of Nature's Path, uh, one of the founders of Nature's Path, Aaron, had said that organic is not a passing fad. It is sweeping over the nation like a tidal wave. He said that in 1971. <laughs> so, I think the tidal wave in 1971 was decidedly a little smaller than it is now, but that speaks to how long the company has been committed to organics. Um, there are very precious few organic companies or organic farms that are approaching their 50th anniversary, uh, but they are one of them. So I guess one of, the, what, one of the other things he had commented was that purchasing and cultivating organic farmland uh, really demonstrates their commitment to the future of the industry. One of the other uh, founders, the co-founder of this, uh, Ratna Stevens, uh, described in an article in Globe and Mail that people are my strength and my weakness. And I really like that uh, statement as it speaks to some of the challenges we've had as well at the farm level. But it, I guess the reason I included it, because it really speaks a bit to nature's path and uh, their triple bottom line, to be both socially, uh, socially responsible, environmentally sustainable, and financially viable. And we try to bring all of those three elements into the farm as well. And so um, certainly we've tried to strike that balance between profitability and sustainability and try to make those both fit in uh, to, into the farm. So really the, and I guess obviously the other part I was going to say is that when a big organic brand ends up stepping into the uh, farm world, uh, it definitely catches some notice. So this is a piece that the producer had did on the farm. A um, little more just specifically about the farm though. So right now we are around 31 quarters, so we're just under 5,000 acres. Um, but of that, we're really only around 3,500 acres cultivated, uh, given that we're on the shores of the, uh, of the Duck Mountains in a fairly region with a lot of hills and bluffs and, uh, and sloughs. So that remaining portion of our land um, is that 1,500 remains sort of between pasture, bush, and, and, and wetlands really growing a mix of cereals, oil seeds, and legumes that are typical for East Central Saskatchewan. Um, you know, in 2018, we grew some oats, peas, uh, some, uh, some wheat, flax, alfalfa. You know, there's no exotic Ethiopian teff or Bolivian quinoa. Just growing straightforward, you know, average crops for the region. And I guess we can probably speak a bit to some of the crop mix uh, later on in some of the other questions. But I guess just for point of reference, when I was looking to describe what we were doing, um, part of our land had been organic for a number of years. Uh, and with the owners of the company, it was not an option to not transition over the other land. So we purchased another farm, transitioned it, started transitioning immediately. But the three-year average really described what the previous organic producer was doing, and then the the other piece describes what we ended up doing last year. So um, really similar portion of cereals, similar portion of oil seeds, but where we really started to differ was in some of our management and related to soil building and trying to minimize fallow. Perfect. So, oh, thanks. Um, so now that you three have introduced yourselves, thank you for doing that. I'll jump into the next question, and then after that one, I promise we'll allow some time for, for you guys to ask questions. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to ask you, uh, what are some of the biggest challenges that your operation faces as a result of being larger than average scale? And so that kind of can cover anything from production, operational management, agronomy, whatever, wherever you want to go with that. So. However you want to start, I'll leave it up to you. <laughs> I didn't want to go, oh, 
Uh, I didn't really want to go first on this one. I was curious to hear the others uh, answer on this. When I kind of think to this, I mean, I would say it really, and, and obviously this is probably a challenge for farms at a smaller scale as well, but it's sourcing adequate and capable staff. Um, absolutely is my, has been my greatest challenge so far. I hadn't really anticipated the scope of how difficult it is to get the right team members to get on the farm. Uh, and especially as a new farm, ensuring that we have the right amount, not, not too many, not too few, was a real challenge as well because there wasn't a good example um, of pre prior years to kind of base our decisions on. And I didn't want to, as a farm manager, over hire and then end up inflating our wage side. But I also ended up in the point where we were probably short staff and that impacted, you know, a lot of what's capable. Test. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, a couple of things come to mind when I, when I was thinking about this. Um, one would be the ability to know your land, and the other one would be uh, the use of capital. So knowing your land, the bigger you get, the harder it is to keep really good tabs on all of the, the pieces of land that you have. I know in the last five years, our farm doubled from about just under 2,500 acres to where we are today to 4,500 and that's a lot more land to look after it's a lot more to know to scout to uh, You know to remember the background fertility on and the history and what you've tried where and when and I, I believe that all of those things go into making for good management um, But it does take more time and energy and we do spend a lot of time Driving around just looking at fields because that's that's what we need to do uh, to get to know your land um, on the capital side of things uh, like I said in the intro, we have 12 different divisions on the farm, and each of those divisions, they have their own manager, and they're each vying for their own, you know, their own upgrades. They, they all need an inf a little bit of an infusion every year to, to keep them going. And so I think one of the, one of the biggest challenges for our farm manager is, is to look at all the priorities of all 12 of those divisions and say, well, this year you're getting this, or you're getting that, or you're getting that. It's a huge undertaking. And... And in a lot of ways, what it forces us to do is be a little bit more creative with how we use our resources, for one, and also, um, also look to neighbors and other people to help us out with things. And probably a good example of that is this year, we, we wanted to try some edible beans. Uh, and we only wanted to do 80 acres because that's all we could get a contract for. But we're not going to go out and buy a bean combine, a windrower, a cutter, and all these other pieces that we need to get these things going. And so, so we thought, well, who could we, who could we rope into you know, getting, us, or getting to come to our farm to help us out with some of those things? So, so we found a couple of neighbors that were willing to you know, kind of give us a day out of their busy schedule and, and come and, and work for us for a day. And so we were able to make it work. So a little bit of creativity. Uh, when it comes to solving that particular problem, I think goes a long way. <clears throat> yeah, challenges. I, I think we kind of chose to go last because we've, we've, we've got pretty much every problem you could ever imagine. Um, I mean, we, we started in 2014 with 7,000 acres, and this last year we planted 42,000. And, I mean, that's just got growing pains like you wouldn't believe, and anyone who's got a child between the age of one and five knows what it's like, that infant stage where we need to be big boys, but we are really learning first how to crawl, then we're learning how to walk, then we're learning how to fall, and then we're learning how to get back up as well. And, and uh, um, people, that, that actually has been our greatest asset, I think, by accident and just to, you know, try to try to be there for people, we just kept saying yes to anyone who wanted to come be a part of this farm. And uh, we probably, I should have maybe done a better job of forecasting the cost of that, but we see now that that's actually, if I would say we have one greatest asset, it's our people. And, and it's because our people are farmers. And our, our people all came from a farm background. You know, they've come from all over the world to be with us, and they aspire to be farmers. So this isn't a short-term thing, and they've come with their families and their wives. And, and I think that that's the only thing that gives men the strength and the power to endure what the, the kind of hours that we put in on our farm, the kind of push. I mean, we were tallying how many hours we put on just our four-wheel drive tractors and our combines this last year. 
And thank you, Lynn, for that. And, and I think it was about 16 and a half thousand hours. And uh, so kind of take that into perspective. And that's in kind of really two big crunch windows, which is seeding and harvest. And uh, so I think like that's the greatest strength. That's what's given us the footing and the foundation, you know, that and faith, of course. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I think uh, the, the biggest obstacles, this is what, you know, cash flow has been, you know, when you're talking about money, well, I don't have a shareholder to go to, so I have to go to banks and I've got to convince them of what we're trying to do. And I've got to show them that there's a viable path to profitability. And, uh, and I need to convince them when we're the minority, we're the 1%, you know, of organic farmers. So, you know, I, I, I went to a football game with Farm Credit Canada and two of the guys that represented people, one represented about 105, he had zero organic customers. This guy, repre Gabe, represented about 90 some and he had one and I'm like, does that count me or, or is that one plus me? And he said, no, you're the only one. You know, so, so the problem is, is the lending institution does not fully understand the language that we're trying to speak. And, uh, and I see that as a huge obstacle to overcome, but we're doing it. I mean, that's the only thing that's got us to this point. Um, and we really hope that we're going to be able to do things to help others with access to capital. Um, we're engaging in talks with them to see if there's other things we can do to work towards helping other young farmers, even the people within our very own team, you know, purchase land to begin with and, and whatnot. And, and, uh, and then I think, you know, a very close point that kind of ties to that because to access to capital, you know, we had a lot of reputation and relationship um, because of our conventional farm and we owned some John Deere dealerships, so we had some credibility, so to speak, um, and that I got to kind of coast on that for, for, for quite a few years in our startup. And, uh, and then we started to get results. We had, we had a very patient land owner, you know, that worked with us. He also, you know, offered us all kinds of additional work to improve the land, which was cash flow. You know, we were kind of that land improvement division sort of internally. So then that helped us sort of uh, cash flow growth and investment into additional machinery and additional people. Um, but I think like, you know, and my wife were talking about this on the way up, the biggest challenge we are having is turning a crop that is worth a lot of money into that money. <laughs> because there isn't a lot of banks, these very guys that were very gracious and let me convince them of this to kind of take a couple loaves of bread or take a couple bags of flour. I mean, that just doesn't happen anymore. And we're seeing that the marketplace is in a sense almost using us as the reason to depress prices. And, you know, when they're saying it's new supply and it's blah, 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 but they're not taking into account retiring farmers. They're not taking into account people that are scaling back. They're just taking, you know, a Western producer article and saying there's way more organic acres. And, uh, you know, from the farmer to the farmer, you know, we are not trying to push down prices and we're trying to fight this battle incredibly hard because, you know, we're selling transitional peas that are chemical free going into Asia for a 30 to 40% premium, yet they're telling me my organic wheat is worth two or three dollars less than the highest price that I've sold it for, or the average price. And I think that there's a lot of people trying to race into the middle of the farmer and the consumer. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that that is a big challenge that lies ahead you know, um, for every organic farmer in this room is liquidity and, and, and fair liquidity, because there's liquidity at a discount, but there's, you know, the true market value. And I, I think trying to hold the value of this, because the consumer still wants it and they want it even more after, you know, the things that have been in the press and the media around chemical and, and, and contamination and, uh, and there's all kinds of grain companies and everything else that are all trying to get into the space right now. And, and I think it's a time where we as farmers really need to band together and stand strong and stand firm and do whatever we can to hold the value because the value is there. And, 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 and the urban population and the marketplace is, is loud and clearly saying, we want what you guys do. But the problem is there's all kinds of people in the middle that are trying to take all those dollars and they're trying to take a share of almost everybody's farm. 
and I see that as the biggest threat to the industry today. So, yeah. Is this on? Okay. Thank you so much for your responses, gentlemen. Um, do, are there any questions at this point from anyone in the audience? It's hard for me to see you, so just wave your arm if, you're, if you do have a question. Don. I'm just going to repeat that in case some people couldn't hear it. So the question was asking about how on large acres or even how this applies to farms of all scales, if you guys have any tips or tricks for record keeping um, for trucks and bins and various things like that, shipments. Um, well, Jolene knows what we do with record keeping. <laughs> um, yeah, that's... The paperwork, you know, everyone says it's incredibly intimidating initially when you're outside of it. And it is incredibly intimidating and challenging for a guy like me. Like, I'm just not the paperwork guy. And, uh, and we've, uh, I think like the biggest thing we've realized is to know kind of what's going on in the field and to track that information. We've, we've adopted simple solutions like WhatsApp. It's, it's an application that you can create all these different pages, whether it's harvesting, whether it's the grain bin log, whether it's, you know, um, our land improvement work. So essentially, kind of real time, the guys are logging information. Jolene, you know, she's at home, she's logging the information on a spreadsheet, you know, so we're kind of continuously tra tracking what's happening, what's going in and out of the farmyard. Um, and we're discovering, I mean, that was a big reason too why we decided I think it was two years ago or three years ago, you know, when you talk about equipment and cleaning it and everything, that's why we just went all in. You know, we, 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 we decided kind of last minute to just, we're not going to have conventional and we're not going to have organic and we're not going to have to clean equipment out between and try to plan all that because that just, that was an absolute, you know, there's nothing that drove me crazier than it being 30 degrees, sunny, chance of rain, and we're washing equipment out, you know, to get the combines moving to the next, you know, piece of organic land. And, uh, and we just kind of said, too, I mean, if we truly believe in this, we got to go all in, and it's going to make our life simpler and easier. I don't know if I would recommend transitioning everything at once. That was incredibly financially challenging and painful, but we're kind of coming through that right now. I mean, this last crop year, we were 50% was registered organic. This following year, we're up to 75. Um, so that really helps the revenues and the ability to cash flow and pay the bills. Um, but, but the documentation piece, um, and we're talking to a group called AgriSecure. I mean, we've been courted by almost every granular and all these farm logs and We've been trying to figure out, you know, a system that really works and meshes with organic. And uh, of all of them, this AgriSecure seems, you know, they're a group out of the U.S. Um, so we're looking at potentially working with them. They want an outrageous number per acre, but we're getting them way down to kind of what's mm -hmm. fair. And uh, yeah, because I think information is going to be incredibly important in the future. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a place that... Uh, the other side of the industry is going to try to attack to a greater degree in the future. Um, so I think knowing what's happening and having as detailed records as possible, I think is going to be a strength to this entire industry. You know, so we are definitely, I mean, we'll keep you posted with what we're finding that's working right, right, well right now, but a WhatsApp application with a whole bunch of more or less sort of processes tied to a great person entering this data, you know, on a spreadsheet. That's kind of where we're at today. Thanks. Do either of you two have anything you'd like to add? <laughs> like maybe just real quick, uh, David, to answer your question, we, um, we've tried to make it as much as we can a part of the culture, as in this is just something you do when, you know, when after you've loaded grain out of a bin, you go back and you put it in the log kind of a thing. So, so you don't forget, you do it right away. 
Um, it is extra work, definitely, and it takes some getting used to, but it's one of those things you just, uh, you just got to put your head down and do it. I guess when I think to my role uh, in my many years working as an organic inspector, I was probably one of the things I would be, my little quotes I would say is, I don't care if you write it down on a grease-covered notebook that you keep in your pocket or you enter it into a complex app on your phone. As long as there is a record there that achieves the end goal, knock yourself out. Find a system that suits you because if you try to impose another system on you or your farm operation, it's never going to work. So. Uh, I think it has to be adapted to the people you have working with you. Um, and creating that culture, obviously, is, um, is an important part. And I, I guess I, I sort of laughed at your comment because it was the, uh, one, of, one of our blowouts with staffing this year was one of my employees throwing essentially a tantrum, cuffing me upside of the head, and swearing up and down that he couldn't be a bleeping bleeping secretary. <laughs> so... He's not with us anymore. Uh, no. Yeah. So again, the, like, the, the guy I found to replace him was awesome. And he, you know, and he, as he said, well, this is just what I do. Of course, I'm going to write down when I serviced which machine, when I went into which field, and try and jot down notes. That's what I do. And if that's what you need me to do, great. No problem. I'm on the clock. You're paying me. So yes, you, you just need to do it. <laughs> Thank you. And also, I should mention that um, I guess it was almost a year ago now, Stuart wrote a really good article for a newsletter that would be on the Manitoba Organic Alliance website, which was Stuart's five tips for record keeping. So you can get more than the tips he gave you if you go check out that article. <laughs> Actually, I think it was. There might have even been a picture of it. Um, so I think we'll move on to the next question. If you had a question, please hold on to it and we'll have lots of time at the end, but I want to cover some of these here. So uh, when we were planning some questions for today, one of the things that uh, a lot of people thought would be a good question to ask would be, given the specific amount of time that's required to manage certain operations on the farm, how do you balance labor and equipment resources and people in order to get things done effectively and efficiently? And so maybe, Jason, you can start this one. Yeah, that's, that's a big question. Um, the first thing that kind of came to mind when I started thinking about this was, uh, was how we manage our weeds. And um, weed management, at least in our organic farm, starts two to three years ahead of when we actually plant a specific crop. And I'm thinking more along the lines of our onion crop, which onions is probably the least competitive crop you'll ever find. And so, so it's really cost effective to keep as many weeds out of that field as you can. And so it influences a lot of our decisions even two and three years uh, before, whether that means we take down a green manure earlier uh, to make sure that the weeds don't go to seed or we, we we send that cultivator through for an extra pass in some of the grain crops before we get to that, to that onion field. So it, it's really about thinking ahead. Um, and when it comes to the actual, the actual season, um, we do a lot of our planning in the wintertime and specifically uh, about what equipment is going to work in which field. Um, we know the capacities of all of our equipment. So we know that our camera cultivator can roughly handle about 700 acres of hemp every year comfortably. And so we won't plant any more than that unless we have more capacity with our cultivators. Um, so a lot of that determines how we, you know, how we, how we plan for the, uh, for the summertime. And then during the season, um, again, it comes back to knowing your land, uh, driving around, checking those crops, knowing, uh, you know, the stage of your weeds, how clean is the field, does this field need to be done again, that field had a half an inch of rain, do we need to go somewhere else? And because, because of our size, we cover probably a 40 mile stretch from north to south. And you know, you send one guy 20 miles in one direction and you make the wrong call, well, you waste half to three quarters of a day just driving to try and get to the right field. Um, so that's where it comes back to really good management, uh, being on top of things and, and knowing what's in your fields. Well, I would say this definitely, it's an ongoing learning process and uh, looking forward to year number two. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm, 
I guess uh, really what are trying to, uh, definitely trying to improve the execution in the second year. So I guess one of, thinking back to some of the challenges we faced, uh, I would see this as using some of the same strategies farms uh, would use of a smaller acreage base, ensuring that all of our equipment is field ready over the winter, that we are we've gone through everything, we've made sure all of those repairs are in place. Um, really, I guess I, I underestimated the value of having all of the sort of seed right on farm. I was like, ah, you know, we can just take a trip down to the seed, uh, seed plant, it's not that far. No, I want to have all the seed, all the inputs, everything there, ready to roll. As soon as that snow melts, we're just ready to execute. I, I really, when I think of this, um, it is some of the same strategies and challenges I think farms of any scale uh, really, really will face. And they're solved by those same ways, trying to be on top of the, uh, uh, of the land base, be on top of your equipment, getting to know it, um, and some of the things that Jason mentioned. Um, the biggest, I guess the biggest challenge is, you know, I, um, my dad moved from southern Manitoba to uh, Mooseman, Saskatchewan. He grew up in Gretna, and in 1979 is when he started his farm in Saskatchewan. And uh, he knew the importance of timing and to get in early, and 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 you need proper equipment to be able to do that. And 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 you need. I mean, my grandpa tells me stories that he'd come back to the field and find Dad with the unload auger on, slunched over the steering wheel of of the combine because time was the only advantage he had um, when he was trying to build the farm. And we've uh, we've definitely fought with weather, you know, sort of the first years, you know, since we started in 2014, we've had a lot of crazy falls, early, you know, snow, we've had late rains, we've had nine inches of rain in a weekend, we've had, we've had a lot of challenging sort of uh, seasons, but I almost kind of feel like that's going to be a bit of the norm going forward. Um, so we've, and, and, and it's just, how do you balance you know, again, I go back to the amazing people we have. Well, they all have families. <laughs> so, you know, like I'm not seeing my daughters. They're not seeing their sons and daughters um, for very long periods of time. And we've, you know, growing up, we always took Sundays off, you know, the day of rest. And uh, I fought that for the first year or two because I'm like, we're a startup. So I justified all these reasons why, you know, we had to be able to push, especially because... There was a chance of rain on Monday, so let's just work Sunday. <laughs> and uh, what we've really kind of come back to is we need to take Sundays off. I mean, we, we work incredibly hard the other six days of the week. And I think everybody needs, you know, time to just unplug, you know, even if it's for a day, you know, and be with family and really sort of honor what's truly important to kind of have the energy to endure for the next six, six days of the week. So that's, that's been a practice to really not burn out our people, even though I still think we burn out our people, <laughs> you know. Um, but everyone, again, being farmers, they understand that, you know, you know, we're up against the weather and we can't control that. So, so we've, uh, it's back to kind of, you know, the management thing is what the guys have really been talking about. And, and you know, I've been learning. You know, I, I, I ran the equipment for dad, you know, all the years, but I didn't have to manage the farm and the complexities and the, the financial side of it, the marketing side of it, the, the purchasing side of it. And uh, I know that that's been a real never-ending sort of burden that, that uh, that has been a part of you know my life over the last five years and and uh, and my wife's li wife life because she's laying next to me when I can't sleep and when I get up and then I run around the house and I go sit in front of the computer and and uh, so I think managing our time and trying to simplify things you know we did I was at an intercrop thing and you know, loved what the guy said, and that spring we went out and seeded 25,000 acres of intercrop, you know, so it was a big, bold, you know, this looks like this is the answer, and we still believe it's the answer, but we definitely didn't take into consideration the time and effort to separate the two, to clean the two, you know, and then we pushed so hard through the entire summer, and when the cleaner, you know, the guys were laughing, 
We've had it for one year and it has 2,000 hours on it. <laughs> you know, so there's another sort of example of, of how much, you know, sometimes the temporary decision that you think is going to solve a lot of problems creates new problems. So you just got to be willing to kind of dig into those. And you've got to have a team of people that are also invested enough that they too, with passion and not begrudgingly, will do these tasks because because we all need to be there, be available, and be ready when it's time to start putting the crop into the ground in May again. So that, that's kind of, we definitely don't have this all figured out, and we're working on it, but we're really, you know, I, th I think it's great what Jason is doing. They, they've really compartmentalized the farming operation and kind of created guys that are experts in, in each thing, and, and uh, that, that, that kind of sort of leads to the simplification that we're trying to do. Um, because, you know, you don't eat an elephant in one bite. You eat it one bite at a time, essentially. So we've got to just sort of break things down to today and what are we going to do today and, 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 and trying to have, you know, I really empower people. I mean, that's something we've done that I think has helped the execution of our farm substantially. I mean, we're, we're surprisingly doing a pretty good job of getting the job done when we need to get it done. And we're spread out, you know, over about 100 and, and some kilometers from one end of the farm to the other. So we've got these moving logistics, we've got weather logistics, we've got times where, you know, one farm will miss a rain and we're like, should we all move? And it's like, we've learned, no, <laughs> we should just hang tight because, you know, we're just gonna, all we're gonna do is spend a whole bunch of time driving and the guys actually need rest more than we need to kind of gain that extra inch over here. So, yeah, that's, that's some of what we've learned. Thanks. Stuart, I don't know. Did you go with this one already? My, yeah. my bad, sorry. <laughs> um, are there any questions from the audience on this one? Go ahead. So the question was how many people approximately additional per acre in comparison to a conventional farm would you need to get the job done? That's a good question. If, if I had to guess, just based on what I've seen, and maybe our situation is a bit unique because we have, we have vegetables and other specialty grains, but, but I would say that it's probably close to, to double. You know, I, I think about running 3,500 acres uh, and um, my family farm, they have about 2,500, and they could do it with two to two and a half guys. And to run about the same amount of grain on the organic side, we're, we're looking at about, you know, three to four. Um, I mean, it all depends on your priorities and, and that, but, um, but for us, that seems to work pretty well. I don't know if you wanted to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. we're uh, same thing. I mean, we, uh, we're up to 30 something people kind of when we hit fall and and uh, harvest and and uh, and what we're trying to do actually is we're trying to actually figure out how can we better manage processes so to speak we're, we're trying to almost kind of look at this as a, a linear okay this one week period this one week period and you know who could move to what and and we're really trying to we did a lot of juggling you know, the guys would have to jump out of this machine and into that, and then that guy jumps into his, and then they don't look after it the same way, and then it creates other friction. So we're, we're, we're trying to, again, just simplify things um, and make it more like, you know, we kind of joke, we're, you wouldn't consider us a family farm, but we're a farm of families, so we need to figure out how to work together as a family, you know, and we need to figure out how to manage, um, you know, sort of strengths and, and, uh, and, and find ways to you know, sort of collaborate where, you know, a team of guys figure out, okay, look after this problem that we've encountered. And uh, yeah, I mean, we're, you know, we, we see the money that we're investing into people though is money we're saving that we're not putting into chemical. And, and I think that that also goes a long, long ways for, you know, maybe filling schools back up in these small towns. And that goes a long, long ways towards, you know, putting people back in houses that were empty or, 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 or amazing wives that are helping out, you know, at the Ford dealership or, 
or, or the nursing homes. And, you know, so we're, we're seeing, you know, don't look at people and going out and hiring good full-time people as an expense, it's an asset. You know, and, and I think like that's the thing, you know, and maybe that starts with your son or daughter that lives in the city that's really wanting to get back home. You know, I think take the chance on trying to figure out how to make it work because that's what's kind of got us to this point, is just believing that people are the most valuable thing around us and within these operations. And, 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 and because that isn't just somebody that can run a tractor incredibly well, that's somebody that can identify efficiency gains. That's somebody that can identify, because they all want to go home sooner too, you know, and see their family. So there's motivation to kind of get out of that piece of equipment if we can. You know, so we're, we're looking at creative ways to do less tillage. We're looking at creative ways to, you know, let the plants do a lot more work for us and just try to work smarter, not harder. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you need people and you need a team. You know, I'm so preoccupied with just keeping this thing funded and financed that, you know, the guys are really, you know, on the ground making the decisions and making the calls. So, so people is everything, I would say. Do you have anything to add there, Stuart? No, okay, great. Are there any, is there a second question from the group? Uh, the question was about uh, the possibility of livestock incorporation. Stuart, I think you should start this one. <laughs> I thought about it. <laughs> But that's about where we're at. Uh, we, uh, we do have, we're renting out some pastures over to uh, some, some neighboring cattle producers. And, and I do think, I mean, obviously when you look towards uh, a lot of the visionary ideas that are changing agriculture right now, a lot of this livestock integration really comes into play. The challenge will be how one does that at scale, uh, you know, with acres. So I do believe it's possible, but I think what I, the way I saw it fitting and the way I've kind of talked with ownership about it, don't add that onto my plate, don't add, but what we need to do is collaborate and, you know, and to, to try, try and I see a real opportunity where for, say, a young producer who loves cattle but doesn't have access to the acres, well, I got the acres. I've got, you know, and I do have, you know, where the farm does have some financial backing. So if we need to invest into getting up some perimeter fences, yeah, we could do that, absolutely. I mean, we've got, you know, some of the heavy equipment. If we need to clear some forest, we could do that. We've, so what I see as an opportunity is finding a young person to partner with who's really keen and excited about cattle and really needs that acreage base. Well, now we can create another sort of enterprise, create another, you know, value, allow an opportunity for somebody else in the community um, but right now it sort of remains as the conceptual idea rather than executed idea, but I definitely see the value in it. It's just, I'm not smart enough to take on the cows. We had 50 sheep on our farm this year. Uh, it's not a whole lot. It was enough to graze down about six or seven acres. Uh, but it's, it was a start for us. It was something to look into. It was a bit of an experiment. And uh, we saw the value in it um, at least for myself, it was, um, it was kind of an economic thing and wanted to figure it out, but we spend a lot of time and energy working down our green manures, working it into the field, and then replanting something to let it regrow again kind of a thing. And wondered if, if maybe the sheep or cattle or something else would be a viable way to do exactly that. So you're, you're, you're grazing everything down, you're returning those nutrients to the soil in the form of manure, and, uh, and it doesn't cost us a tractor hour to do it. The complicated part is you know, like you guys were saying, is the infrastructure, the fencing, um, and, and also the labor to, to be able to move, you know, move these animals when you need them. And so the deal I had worked out, this was one of our, our neighbors that we were working with, uh, was that, you know what, you can come graze whatever you want on this particular piece of land, uh, but the only interaction I want with the sheep is to be able to drive by and bring my kids to see them. <laughs> That's about as close as I want to get. And so he was okay with that because it was free, basically free feed for him for his, for his use over the summer. And uh, it worked out pretty well. Um, what it looks like to scale something like that up, though, that's a much bigger task. And we've dreamed about that a bit and, and heard from some cattle producers that you can get these GPS collars that allow the 
whatever, you put them on the cattle, when they get close to the, the edge of the geofence, it gives them a bit of a shock and keeps them in a specific pasture. Um, so if, if you could work with something like that, it means no fences, it means no moving, it's some, you know, I, the, the dream is that some guy on a computer on a Sunday morning can just say next, and they move to the next pasture kind of a thing. Uh, so if it ever comes to that, then it definitely becomes viable. But, uh, but at this point, uh, again, you've got to find somebody to do the work. Yeah, we definitely, uh, we would love to have a lot of animals and cattle um, throughout uh, the operation. I mean, we spread manure on, oh, I don't know, like 16 or 1,700 acres this fall. And that is a lot of work, <laughs> and, it's a, and, and, and it is a lot of moving pieces and a lot of time. And uh, so we'd love to find alternatives that, you know, are, are better than that. And, uh, um, you know, Mark, he, you know, he's heading up, you know, a little bit of a program that we're working on right now. You know, we've got a lot of organic screenings, you know. Um, we're going to have more as more land becomes organic. And... Uh, um, so we've got the supply of the feed, which to my understanding about animals is, is, is especially in the organic sector, is one of the big limiting factors. Um, so we're kind of taking what we've got as a resource and trying to figure out how to be a steward of it. Um, I'm telling all the guys, you guys can buy as many cattle as you want, move them into organic, I'll provide the feed, you know, and, but again, it's kind of like Jason said, I don't know anything about this stuff, so you're going to have to convince the bank to give you the money for the, the cows. I'm never going to be able to, but, but you can tell them and assure them that we have access to the organic feed, and we've got a lot of land and dirt that we're going to shift, you know, sort of. We, we are looking at it as a tool to kind of rebuild and regenerate. We've got a lot of uh, diverse histories uh, to the land that we're farming. Um, we've got a range of probably 40 bushels to the acre on wheat this year from our poor land to our better land. And, and from a soil class rating, the land is rated the same. It's just been treated very differently from an organic matter perspective. And in the, the, these years that we've had leaner moisture, we're really seeing the difference uh, that organic matter plays in the potential of a crop. And uh, um, so we are you know, looking at some strong legume and alfalfa-based you know, rotations on some of this dirt, and, and then that's going to give us access to probably a cut of feed. We'll want to leave the other cut out every year. Um, and uh, um, my wife and Jolene are actually working on a chicken and turkey project. <laughs> but we're running into, this is crazy, but the bureaucracy around, what do they call it? What's quota? Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, there's people like crazy that want pasture-raised, organic birds, you know, for meat um, and turkeys. And uh, we've got the feed to do a lot of them, um, but we're running into just market protectionism. And, uh, and, uh, and then there's the whole conventional versus organic and all of that as well, which creates even more interesting conversations that my wife has been privy to. So um, we, we love what the manure could do for us. Um, but we know that it takes a lot of skilled people that really understand animals to really make this work and make this fly. Um, and, the, and we're doing it, you know, from a micro perspective. I mean, that's the way we're focusing on it. We're just, we're going to start small and we're going to just try to eat ourselves out of our own feed. And if we can accomplish that and if the market will support us, you know, in purchasing this pasture raised organic meat, you know, we're definitely going to find ways to do more of it. And if any of you have got a big passion to want to turn some of your animals organic, we should talk because we could probably swap, you know, something, feed, and, and even just take a share of whatever that animal becomes worth in the future. I, I think it's collaboration that's going to help us farmers as a whole, you know, sort of elevate our, our future potential. So. Great. Thank you. Um, I think we have a sec for one more question on that, if anybody has something they'd like to add. Okay, maybe I'll just ask one quick, because it's something that we've been talking a lot about at work, and Travis kind of touched on it. Um, obviously, it's a very complex question, so you don't need to get into it too much, but I think that the way that things have been going the last couple of years with the weather, the one thing that I've noticed is we haven't really had long stretches of rain. 
So not so much from the production standpoint, but how do you manage avoiding burnout and not having weather like forcing you to take a break and forcing you to not go out into the field and do stuff? So have you, have you experienced burnout or how do you make sure you or your staff that you're managing aren't getting burnt out during the season? <laughs> Another good question. Um, at Crakers, we're, I think we're similar to you guys in the sense that we, we always take Sundays off. Um, we always, for the families that work on the farm, they always know that at least Sunday is a day that they can take for themselves. And I think for a lot of those guys, that is the reason that they'll come back on Monday morning. Um, <laughs> really. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, like you say, that, that work-life balance is incredibly hard to figure out in farming. It just, it just is. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so uh, I don't know if I have any good answers for you. It's just it's something that we talk about on an ongoing basis on the farm particularly. And uh, it's something we're all trying to figure out. I think it's going to be a little bit different for everybody. We've, we've kind of found that the, the young single guys that are in their early 20s that don't have a family to go home to, they love to be there till 8 or 9 or 10 at night. And, the, you know, the guys that have, they have three young kids at home can't wait to get home by supper kind of a thing. And so... So being a bit flexible in management as far as giving people hours when they need it uh, can go a long way. Um, and uh, I don't know, that's, that's probably good. Okay. It was one of the things when starting in the hiring process that I really tried to find people that were we're looking for an opportunity to a meet those crazy hours when we really needed them but then as the other side to it that i needed to be flexible for them that you know i've got employees who are single parents and you know and if he needs to get home to take care of his kids well then you got to get home and take care of your kids it's only you know it's i, I really had to create a mindset that if i'm going to demand people go the extra mile then i've got to be willing to be flexible for them and create a culture where we do have that balance between the periods of high demand on all of on that we place upon ourselves or we ask of others but then also ensuring that yeah at this point in the, of the season you know just take it easy go home and you know and, and rest because we there will be time to work hard again later Perfect. Yeah, like we're, we're still a work in progress with all of this. Um, again, you know, it was how hard my dad worked and how much time he put in, which allowed him to build a farm. So it's hard to not remember that, so to speak. And, and now we're not able to be doing all the work. So we, we need to really rely on an incredible team of people to accomplish that. And, uh, and I think I think how we've been able to is, is everyone is passionate about being a farmer and everyone is passionate about what we're trying to do and accomplish and you know the guys all went to a soil health um, seminar um, a couple of months ago and, and I think that that just really instilled a lot of purpose um, in what we're doing and what we're accomplishing and and, and, and how it truly will impact the health of people now and in the future. So I think a bit of it is to cast a bit of a vision for where you're going to go with practical steps of how you're going to get there. And I may not be the greatest at the latter, <laughs> the practical steps of how we're going to get there, but, you know, I've, fortunately, when you kind of just are who you are, and you, you, you're really unapologetic about that and you're real with yourself and you're confident in who you are, you tend to tr attract similar people. I've found, you know, when you don't force hire people, when you're not, you know, just trying to fill a position, I mean, we never ever view anything like that. We're, we, we just want, you know, similar and like-minded people and, uh, and it's amazing actually how unanimous sort of the vote is that we push hard and, and how, how sacrificial people are willing to be when they believe there's a bigger purpose to what they're doing. And, and uh, you know, we're, we're just, you know, so thankful for that. And we give lots of, you know, we've got pretty tight parameters around seeding and harvest. You know, again, that Sunday is a non-negotiable, so everyone knows and can anticipate for that. And I think that it's just that, that, that sort of like, you know, it's something to look forward to, you know, at the end of the week. And, and I know as a young kid on the farm, 
like we loved that and we got into all kinds of trouble the night before that day off, you know, and, 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 and it was just because we knew it was kind of a chance to just sort of take a deep breath and then refocus again. And, uh, um, and we're incredibly flexible with everyone through the summer and through the winter. You know, there's kind of the tasks that need to be done and, and it's incredible um, how people will just rise to the occasion you know, and, and, and the guys, you know, you're like, come on, stay home. You know, <laughs> like, guys, I, you know, we really need to take a break right now, but we've been surrounded by just such a hardworking group of people that this is the norm and this is what they love to do too. And, uh, you know, so we're fortunate and blessed, like kind of one of those earlier points. I mean, this is an area where I think we're the strongest. And, uh, and I think that positions us well for the future and the challenges that are going to come before us um, because they're going to come and there's going to be lots of them. Um, but it's really just trying to find ways to intimately look after, you know, your whole team just like you'd look after your whole family. And uh, that's kind of the way we view it. And I think that's, that's how we've got this far. Great. Thank you. Um, so the next question that we had here was, how do you balance, and maybe Travis, you mentioned that there aren't really any specific shareholders in the conventional sense in your farm, but how do you, the other two, balance shareholder influence with the agronomic decisions that need to be made on the farm? And how does that affect your rotation, your crop rotation planning? Uh, well, like I mentioned earlier, we have over 100 different shareholders on our farm. Uh, which can which can make things interesting sometimes. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, we uh, the farm itself and the shareholders. I think they have a really good working relationship, uh, at least from talking to to Marv and some of our other senior management who deal with them a little more than I do. Uh, but but kind of the way he, Marv put it to me was, you know, often the shareholders will bring forward suggestions. Um, they have a really unique perspective because a lot of them are urban. They live in Winnipeg or other urban centers, and so they have a bit of a different. Uh, pulse on on food and farming and some of the other things that that we may not necessarily get uh, being in our our Winkler world and um, and so they'll often bring forward ideas and um, they there's a certain level of trust between them and and us on the farm um, they know that they've they put good people in place that they're going to look into these opportunities and uh, and they're going to tell them if it's a good idea or not so so I feel like there's there's a good give and take between you know Here's some ideas. What do you guys think? Go look into it, and make it work. So, um, so how do we make the balance? I think it's. I mean, I think that that trust is huge, and um, and and just even to listen. I, I know some of the ideas that come up sometimes are a little bit out in left field. Uh, sometimes that's what you need, but uh, more often than not, it's like I think there's lower hanging fruit out there. So let's not let's not get lost in the weeds too much. So, I guess for our farm, we technically don't have shareholders. Uh, we're just actually, it's a family ownership. But the family has a lot of those same questions that any shareholders are going to have who are not on the farm and not making those day-to-day -day, uh, decisions. What's the net profit of the farm? What's the long-term sustainability of those profits? What's the return on investment? But I, I'm really thankful that they also have a whole other level of expectations and influence that relates back to, you know, sustainability at a regional and global level. Uh, how do we achieve sort of the three pillars that I referenced at the start of the talk between, you know, being socially, environmentally, and financially viable? So I really actually, you know, think back to part of Roy's discussion earlier. At the start of the season, I kind of crunched out, you know, where I thought profitability be, would be for a variety of crops. And then we sat down and I said, all right, well, you are at the, at the deciding point. It is up to you. Do you want to have something that we really <clears throat> focus, put a heavy emphasis on cash crops and revenue? Do we want to put a heavy focus on soil building? Do we want to find somewhere in the middle? You know, these are the numbers that are going to be related to it. All three of those options, I feel, would have, been, would have been agronomically viable. They would have met the requirement of the organic standards, but they are the bigger question that they, I wanted actually to put in their decisions for them to be in charge of finding that line between building your soil and creating healthy soils and really focusing on that between the other critically important part of revenue. 
One of those challenges, though, in meeting with any sort of external influence, shareholders, owners, when they're not on the farm and they're not coming from a farm background, is sometimes it is those crazy ideas. Those, uh, it's a greater challenge, especially if they are passionate about pushing ecological outcomes. You know, we really want to reduce tillage on the organic farms. We need to find ways to do this. Okay, that's a great goal. But if you don't have an understanding of which land is that feasible on and, you know, and really getting intimately knowledgeable with that land and knowing, yeah, that one's got a background level of candida thistle and other pernicious perennial weeds, we can't just remove tillage on that. So I've certainly, I think I'm going to have more back and forth with them of how I want to achieve some of their lofty ecological goals or, you know, big picture ideas with the nuts and bolts on the farm. So just have a healthy opportunity for um, decisions um, and decision-making process, and especially as it comes back into the longer-term ideas of rotation planning um, and how that's going to impact our profit, sustainability, and our agronomy. Yeah. And, yeah, like we, uh, we don't have um, direct, you know, I guess shareholder influence, so to speak, um, but we definitely have big stakeholders. Um, I think you know, um, the group of people that are a part of our farm, again, we go back to people. I mean, we're, we're trying to create and craft, you know, ways of buying land together, for instance, you know, and, 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 and to be able to then farm and find ways to participate in the risk. And we're trying to figure out what that looks like during transition phases, because most land that we acquire is going to require a 36-month transition window, which is defi definitely, we're finding ways to you know, break even, you know, but it's hard to find a lot of profitability in that. So we're working on, you know, that scenario essentially to expand our ownership um, outside of our, our family, so to speak, into, you know, to our extended family. Um, a major, I mean, we just renegotiated our land for the next seven years. And, you know, that's a 27,000 acre parcel of land. And, you know, Robert's been a major stakeholder in our growth and our ability to be here and be present. Um, and, uh, and that's, you know, that's an incredibly, you know, sort of important relationship. And, uh, you know, and, and, and he's been incredibly patient with us as well through all of this. Um, you know, our machinery is another major relationship that we're looking at, you know, new ways of exploring machinery ownership and, 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 uh, and, you know, sort of strategies to almost rather than own your machinery and rent your land, you know, we should be renting our machinery and owning the land, you know, putting your debt and, and, and towards an appreciating asset and then trying to just, you know, pay per use essentially uh, the equipment on the farm. Um, and that's back to just addressing capital needs. You know, we've, we've, we've got, you know, probably $15 million worth of equipment and, and a lot of it's used, you know, so that's not even, if we replace that thing at new value, it would probably be 25 million. And uh, um, so we've, and, and, and the fortunate thing is, is we've had to almost create a business strategy that, you know, works with our worst case scenario. And, uh, and, 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 and I just would really encourage everyone to really try to do that. You know, if you know you're guaranteed X bushels per acre, you know, that's what your insurance coverage is, don't look past that. You know, because we've had really great success with uh, lenders under promising, you know, and, uh, and just being real and realistic, essentially, with all of the, the people and partners, especially if you're a conventional farmer that's thinking about going organic, or, uh, or you're an organic farmer that wants to acquire some land, you know, I think, you know, those institutions become your new strategic, you know, I, I wouldn't say shareholder, but stakeholder, mm -hmm. you know, sort of in the success of your operation. So, you know, build a relationship, and even if you don't need it now, you do need to start building that relationship now. And that's, that's, that's been, I think, a lot of what's helped us. And, and what we're really finding, too, is just simpler, simpler, simpler. You know, the, the simpler we can, you know, crop plan we can make, the easier it is to convince the lender that we are going to get and obtain that value for that crop. And, 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 uh, and I think it also, you know, it's just easier on the entire team, too, is, is, is lowering layers of complexity. 
and really try to make your experiments a little smaller. I mean, that's coming from complete experience here, you know, and, and we kind of went all in on things and, and we just had a lot of stuff to learn. So I think that keeps your partners, you know, more um, aligned too, because they, they just, some change is tough for people, you know, um, and, and I think these new ideas have to gradually be brought to the table. Great, thank you. Um, maybe I'll just ask my last question so we have some time to open it up to general questions. Um, my last question was, do you three think that it's possible to farm at the scale that your company or your farm is currently operating at and stay true to the various principles of organic agriculture? And are you able to create any environmental benefits on your farm due to your scale that you might not have been able to otherwise? So, I mean, I would say early on in the organic uh, sort of a, organic movement, the organic agricultural side, sh sh there was absolutely a rejection of scale. Uh, there was, a, you know, many early adopters who are sort of uh, would be influenced by sort of E.F. Schumacher's uh, Small is Beautiful, and some of those concepts would really come through, and you, you even still see it in part of Canada's organic standards uh, in the last revision, they made a limit that you could have no more than 10,000 laying hens as, a, as almost as a cap to what they saw, you know, perhaps what was going on in the States where you have some extremely large um, barns for even with organic layers in it. And really, when I was working as an inspector, I would go to like 200 different farms around Western Canada on the course of any given year. So I got a chance to see a variety of different farms and I really started to realize that there was no correlation between the scale of the operation and how well they were meeting the organic standards and how much they were even exceeding the organic standards. And when I think of the question about laying hens, I remember inspecting a farm that had, you know, we're pushing 90,000 now 90,000 laying hens, which is very large for Canada. They were doing a fan fantastic jobs about animal husbandry, about humane, uh, humane husbandry, getting the birds out. And I think the reason they were able to do that was because they were so large. They could invest into the right technology. They could invest into going around and seeing how they actually made that work in other regions of the world. So by being large, it allowed them to go further. And I think that there is some, uh, some benefit that can come through scale. For example, um, you know, when we like to into innovative ways of managing our green manures and trying to minimize, say, the frequency of tillage from a soil health perspective, the economics of us buying a 42-foot wide mower is very different because we're able to spread them over all those acres. It would be really different uh, for a farm with you know, only three quarters versus those with 30. It, it really does change some of that ability to innovate when you've got the acreage. The other reason I think that scale comes into play for a large farm, and I, and I, I am not bashing small farms that are doing things on a smaller scale by any means. But I think if you only have a very limited acreage base, you may make choices out of necessity. You need to squeeze out another crop. You can't afford to have you know, that piece of land uh, being a net cost in a green manure year because you needed it for cash flow because last year there was some other challenge and you don't have enough acreage to juggle around that balance of soil health versus uh, revenue generating crops. So I think the, when you have enough acres, it allows you to, to, to the question of things that you could not do at a, um, that w some of the environmental benefits that come with that scale, is I can look at some of those poor performing areas and say, you know, actually, and now once we'll get, if I'm gonna say, which is a poor performing for more than one year, because that's all I've got to view on it, but say, all right, well, maybe that's a piece we try and partner with our local watershed organization and so into native, uh, native grasses and native plants. Because I don't need to worry about that 20 acres. I got no obligation to keep that 20 acre chunk in. We've got enough acres to worry about. So I might as well take some of those poor acres out and make them of greater ecological value. Um, and I think the other benefit of scale is about, and this actually gets into the science of ecology, if I only have a few 
fields. If I created, say, a pollinator area, pollinator habitat, it may have very limited ecological benefit because it is in the grand landscape scale of things just a drop in the bucket. But if I'm able to create that same pollinator strip along my boundary between me and another again, a conventional farm, and now we have it as a mile long, and there's multiple ones of them all around the area, it can actually have a bigger ecological impact. And so that's where I think scale comes into play. Thank you. Um, I think to answer that question, I would say, yeah, I think you can stay true to the organic principles the larger you get. Um, and I, I, you know, as, as a farm gets larger and I think about where we were five years ago and where we are today, uh, you know, things, things have definitely got more complex. There's more, there's more land, there's more people, there's more types of crops, there's more paperwork to do, there's all these kinds of things. But along with the extra growth comes more people to do that work. And I think the, the benefit of having more people is you get specialized people. So we have people that specialize in marketing. We have people that specialize in certification. We have people that specialize in operating equipment. And, and to be able to do that and give individual people these specific tasks that they can focus on, I think, you know, kind of like you were saying, Stuart, allows you um, to do those pieces really well. And so it doesn't surprise me that, you, you know, you visit that a chicken farm and, and they were top notch. You know, I, I think it's just you have the people to be able to do it so, uh, so you can do it well. Um, when it comes to the environmental uh, side of things, I, I think there too, I, I look at some of the things that we can do at Crakers that maybe a one man show wouldn't be able to, and that's things like, you know, we can renovate or replant shelter belts. You know, um, we can, we have time to plant pollinator strips around some of our fields. We have time to go uh, rogue out corners, or we have time to, you know, to whatever. All these little details that, that can come along with, with, with helping out the farm from the environmental side of things, uh, we, we kind of have a little bit of the luxury of time to be able to do that with the right people and enough people. <clears throat> yeah, and like, you know, we've kind of reflected. I, I, I think there was somebody that was asking me questions and they were doing a bit of an interview and, you know, saying that we were a pioneer in what we're doing and we're not. I mean, we're, there, there, there's been people that have forged to ensure that this market was a real and sustainable market for, you know, 20 something, 30 years. I mean, you know, and, 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 you know, we're, we, we just came in at a, a time where it seemed like there was a real shift in, 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 in maybe um, awareness, you know, to the consumer and uh, a greater understanding of ways other food was growing. And, and, and so, you know, we're, we're here and kind of, you know, able to do what we're doing just, you know, a, a bit out of luck and good fortune, you know, and, and uh, and, and what, but what we are seeing is, and, and I've kind of told this repeatedly, I mean, we're, we've got such high costs to do what we're doing. I mean, the last thing we want to see is prices of these organic grains go down. We, we actually want to see them go up. And, uh, you know, and everyone from the industry says, no, no, you can't do that. That's not sustainable, da, 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 da. Well, it's because everyone else is trying to take too big of a margin above us before it ends up landing on somebody's plate. And, and, and we're, we're seeing opportunities. I mean, we've got grocery store chains that are interested. We've got Clarence here. He's going to potentially mill some flour for us as well and help us package it and bring it right to Sobeys. And, and, and uh, you know, we're actually we're, we're going to visit with Nature's Path in Vancouver on our way to Germany. And uh, I'm going to propose I want a co-branded cereal. <laughs> He doesn't know that yet, but, but uh, you know, so, so we want to, and, and, and we were in Denver and, you know, in meetings and Panera Bread is, you know, a large, you know, restaurant chain out of the U.S. Well, they're looking for glyphosate-free wheat. And, uh, you know, and we had quite a discussion that that's incredibly disruptive if somebody could give it to them. And I sat across the table saying, well, I know a guy that owns about 60 or 70 franchises in California and Arizona. I think I need to talk to him. So there is, there is a big push. I mean, we're ending up kind of being quite unpopular in a lot of ways because there's a lot of this industry that would never want to see farmers market direct to end users and, and would never want to see farmers develop partnerships with processors and, and have the ability to kind of take it right to the consumer. And we're 
potentially big enough to have enough acres that we could supply, you know, some of these groups, you know, ourselves. And, and then if, if we can't supply enough, we could probably find a few friends that would also transition acres, you know, would be open to a chemical free version, which is kind of a middle market thing that we feel is an opportunity to move farmers closer towards this organic idea. And, uh, and we sort of see ourselves as a bit of a market development tool um, to kind of help, because I, I feel like the biggest and most important thing is to hold the price and to create strength in that and to really, you know, from a humanity perspective, to put value back on food. And, and the longer we go into this, the more years I get under my belt, the more fired up and passionate I get about this. And when people say, you know, feed the world, feed the world, it's, not, it's just not true. And, and it irritates me and frustrates me. And we were incredibly progressive, conventional farmers in our old days. And, uh, and I just feel like there's a lot of things in the marketplace that, you know, we need to fight for farmers again. And, and we got to take the labels off as producers and, and kind of work together and collaborate because I, straight, I think there's incredible strength if we could all come together as one, you know, to this marketplace because the consumers, they want to buy from us. They want to know our story. They want to understand, you know, the challenges we encounter. I mean, we're, we've got a magazine that kind of connects with these consumers that we're, we're meeting with and talking with, and, and they want to kind of like an update of what goes on in the farm. And, and, uh, and I think if we could unite as kind of one voice, you know, and, and we could come together with our creativity and our ideas and our entrepreneurialism, which every farmer has to do just to survive, you know, I think there's an incredible story to be told. And, you know, that's maybe what we feel our place in this. We're not, we're not here to compete or be a threat or any of those things. We, 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 we want to almost kind of protect the farmer from sometimes what I think the industry does to just, you know, I forget who the quote is from, um, but, it, but it's, you know, farmers are, uh, you know, the only ones that sell it or buy at retail, sell at wholesale, and pay the freight both ways. You know, and, 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 and that's the honest to goodness truth and, you know, maybe a bit of the root of what we're wanting to do is just to try to expose some of that and expose the value that farmers bring to humanity and to society and, and find ways to really value you guys more in partnership ideas that we feel might open up, you know, as we progress and evolve in what we're learning and, and our ability to fail forward just because we've got enough, you know, sort of, we can make some mistakes along the way and still kind of carry on. And, and we want to share that. And, and uh, we're actually planning a field day together with Nature's Path as well, you know, kind of this coming summer that's, you know, you can poke around, see what we're doing. and. We're gonna we're gonna show experiments. We're gonna everybody that has a fertilizer that's for organic is trying to sell it to us, and we're we're telling them that you got to give it to us first and show other people, you know, because because we're just afraid of the same thing happening in organic, where, you know, you kind of just reverse mortgage away your entire farm, thirty dollars an acre at a time, and then pretty soon you're left taking the last five percent, and and we're just trying to stop that from happening. So. Perfect, thank you. So we have a few minutes left here before Laura's talk, so I'd like to open it up if anybody has had a burning question that wasn't covered over the last hour and a bit. Oh, there you go. Uh, the question was, has any of the gentlemen up here or their employees taken the holistic management class? No, we haven't taken the holistic management course, or at least with my knowledge, none of the other team members would have. And I guess it's because we're a straight grain farm with no cattle. And I've, I think perhaps, inac perhaps inaccurately, really viewed holistic management as a sort of something that has appeal and applicability on the cattle side. And I could well be wrong on it, but you know, as a livestock free farm, um, it hasn't held that appeal. So I'd be curious to hear more from you on that. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, I don't, I'm not 
completely aware of it specifically either. Um, we've, we've gone to all kinds of courses that Sask Organics puts on, um, and uh, I'm actually part of their education committee, so, so we've engaged in a lot of that stuff, uh, soil health, um, regenerative type agriculture pieces, and, and, and understanding that for how we can maintain our soils and build them over time. Um, we're trying to use a lot of plant and plant-based um, nitrogen fixation tools and, and uh, soil building and carbon building tools. Um, but we're very fresh to the, to the animal husbandry part and, and that's what, you know, some of the guys are digging into different things and we're, we're trying to connect with other farmers that are using many of those practices as well. Um, and that's kind of been our approach so far. Thanks. Are there any other questions? There is a one over here I saw a hand, I think. Are there any more questions? Oh, yeah, just shout it out. I can't see you. <laughs> Two of us was no, so it looks like they, they were going to do multi Um Yeah, I, I mean, I all last year, I mean, because we had 75% of our uh, commodity last year was transitional. Um, so I pretty much beat down every door and argued with every grain buyer of why in the world there isn't a premium for, you know, grain grown without chemical, because essentially we grow it with all the same... Um, uh, you know, practices and principles, um, and uh, it's just that it, it has to be 36 months from last chemical or fertilizer banned substance application till the harvest date. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and, and it was interesting because last year, you know, I just, everyone said I was crazy, and then this year, before we even started harvesting our peas, I had about three or four companies saying, hey, do you have transitional peas? because we think we can pay you more for them. And so, you know, fortunately, again, that stubborn, you know, Mennonite German background that I have seemed to have paid off last year. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, this year we're, we've been trading our peas. Um, we don't have any certification because, again, um, we've got a, we've, when we structured the organic farm to begin with, it was in two companies. One was the conventional farm and one was the organic farm because, of, uh, yeah, you're not supposed to grow GMOs and, you know, so the canola at the time, which we've completely gone away from now as well, um, but uh, um, so we never technically had organic registration, so to speak, on our transitional acres. Um, and, uh, but this year, you know, I guess how we got the premium is they just, we sampled it sent away and got residue testing and uh, it was passing the glyphosate test which is a hot topic <laughs> after certain lawsuits and everything um, and uh, so we we actually we negotiated a pretty good premium for those peas and and it's a sizable market I mean it's not I mean we're, we're loading 10 rail cars while I'm sitting here right now you know and that's been an ongoing thing that we've we've been doing so it's a real market I mean I, I I got contacted from another major grain company yesterday <laughs> and, uh, and their head of oil seed procurement is saying they're wanting to get into organic and change an elevator to organic, so they want to talk to us. So, because we also, we're seeing peas and canola, Polish canola are working real well as an intercrop together um, on transitional acres. And we, th there seems to be a tremendous demand developing in Asia, Japan, you know, a lot of these markets for 
residue-free grain and uh, because they don't trust their own markets, so to speak. So uh, the Canadian origin is creating unique value for that. Um, there's U.S. mills um, that are talking about a premium for transitional wheat. They're not getting a premium on the other side, you know, to their consumer. Um, but we're seeing, you know, again, these same grocery store chains, we're actually looking at milling some of our transitional wheat and introducing it as a chemical-free product on the grocery store shelf. So we're doing a bit of this market development ourselves. Um, and, uh, and I've got another mill that I'm talking to out east that uh, they're talking eight to nine dollars for transitional wheat as well. Um, there's a whole bunch of freight complications with rail and how they're gouging. So it's tough for these small companies to compete on a small amount of cars. But that's another whole other story and, and complication. But uh, yeah, and that's a big part of, I mean, I used to have a, a grain brokering business when I was younger. So a lot of this tr marketing and trading and understanding, I mean, what, what was the core of it was producer to end user in niche products like malt barley feed that had low vomit toxin was coming into Hutterite colonies and, and, and a lot of uh, um, canola into crushers before the grain companies kind of got in the middle of all that. So I've kind of come to the realization that I got to put my marketing hat back on and because the guys, again, this is back to that strength of a team. Um, because I, I feel so confident in our people and, and uh, I'm, I'm able to kind of step back from some of the day-to-day -day execution on the farm and, uh, and I'm stepping into marketing and what it's feeling like we're going to keep stepping further that way so that, um, I mean, the success of the brokering I was doing was what we grew on our farm, there was lots of people that wanted it. And then they said, well, is there any other people you know that have the same things and we'll pay them the same prices? And, and I'm kind of feeling like that's a bit of the opportunity that lies before us. And I, and I want to help. We are working specifically on transitional markets to kind of almost make them real and, uh, and transactable to other people and, and, and really identity preserved farm direct type stuff with a story possibility as well. And, and we're, we're seeing a big potential opportunity for that in the marketplace. Great, thank you. And thanks for the questions, those were great. So I'd really like to thank uh, Jason and Travis and Stuart for taking the time to travel here today and share with us some of the information from your production systems. It's been really enlightening for me. And I hope everybody in the audience enjoyed it as well. I know Stuart has to go to Alberta right now, so you won't get to catch him after, but I think the other two will be around for the rest of the day if you had any questions that were left unanswered. So please join me in thanking them for today. <laughs> I think hers. So it's 11.30 and I think we'll jump right into the next presentation. Um, today, for our last uh, session for the Organic Morning, we have Dr. Laura Telford, who's the Organic Specialist with Manitoba Agriculture, um, and she's going to be talking about the growing market for organic foods, trends, and opportunities for producers. Um, so as I mentioned, Laura is the Provincial Organic Specialist, and before that she was Director of Canada's National Organic Farming Operation, Canadian Organic Growers, and Laura also has a PhD in Neuroscience from Queen's University. So please join me in welcoming Laura for her presentation. I point it at up there. Oh.
Okay, can you hear me okay? So I'm just curious, with a show of hands, how many people in the room are already organic farmers? So a good chunk of you. How about thinking about organic? And so I assume the rest of you are here just because you're kind of sort of interested. So, so hopefully uh, I keep you interested. Um, so the, a good reason for why um, I'm doing this talk is because recently, and you heard it a little bit from Travis and others, is there's been a small panic, uh, not a mass exodus, but I would say a small panic amongst organic grain growers about what's happening in the market. And that's probably because we've had four good years. And four good years in agriculture is good. <laughs> and, and, and so there's a little panic that, that things are, are maybe, I've heard it expressed as going to hell, going down the tubes. Um, so I'm here hopefully to allay some of those fears. I maybe won't allay all of Travis's fears, um, but ho hopefully we can avoid some of the panic. And I wanted just to, just to tell you, as, as part of my prep for doing this talk, I interviewed as many um, people in the grain trade industry as I could. And for the most part, although the title of the talk is related to organic foods, I'm mostly going to be focusing on organic grain because that's about 95% of what the organic farmers do in the province. Um, but I will just quickly mention um, vegetables and, and livestock in case there's anyone in the room who's focused on those. Um, so, first of all, let's talk about the overall global organic market. This ain't going away anytime soon, and organic is probably here forever. And maybe if I live long enough, everything will be organic and maybe we can stop using the, that word. Um, so 90 billion dollars, that's a lot of money, right? Canada is 5.4 billion dollars in organic food sales last year alone. And what that means is Canada is now the globe's fifth largest market for organic foods. So organic is not just for export anymore. I know in the grain trade, we tend to think that it is, um, but it, it's more than that. So who's buying organic food in Canada? Well, it used to be British Columbians bought one out of every four organic items sold in the country. It ain't that way anymore. Now it's Albertans, so it's getting closer to the prairie, so that's good news for those of you in this room. Um, big surprise. It's millennials that are now driving it. It used to be rich people, rich white people who lived in urban centers. There's a few of those, and certainly you'll see a higher level of education amongst organic buyers. But the real driver that is a game changer is millennials. And it's not just organic food that they're, that they're changing. They're in the driver's seat for pretty much every consumer good, or maybe not buying consumer goods. They're into that too. Um, so geographically, I would say that organic is still an urban phenomenon. Manitoba is probably the worst, and correct me if I'm wrong, Stuart, the worst market for organic food in the country. Maybe Saskatchewan is a, a toss-up. Um, and that largely has to do with the fact that we don't have any people. Um, we all heard about the historical drivers for organic food, um, but these are some of the things that you don't hear about a lot and are becoming very, very important. So clean labels, I don't know if you've ever seen the ads with the little kids trying to pronounce uh, food ingredients. That's, you know, organic is the first clean and the cleanest of the labels. You know, you'll see products from Nature's Farm that basically say, eggs, flour, water maybe, you know, so, so there's very little on an organic label um, that you can mangle. Um, one of the things that we're seeing that is a, is a shift that I'm very happy about because I'm interested in organic as a, 
as a solution to modern problems, as my friend Dag would say from, from Nature's Path, um, and, and as an environmentalist. Um, historically, North American consumers have bought organic food because for whatever reason, right or wrong, they think it's better for them. So it's that me, me thing. Europeans have always bought organic food because it's better for the planet. And now we're seeing a shift. Guess who's driving it? Millennials. So if you have a kid at home who's under 30, uh, maybe tell them to get out of the house, but <laughs> they're usually the ones driving that, that switch to organic. The other thing that's um, really affecting the grain trade is what I would call fear of glyphosate. That's coming very strongly from Asia and Europe. It's at the point now where fear of glyphosate is now being used as a non-tariff uh, trade issue. Um, so there are, we've pretty much lost Western Europe as a market from North America. Climate change, we don't talk about that very much, but this is becoming, we talk about climate change, but we don't talk about climate change and organic. So this is becoming a big one, especially in policy circles. So if you're finding that organic is getting more traction from governments, you can count on the fact that they think of it as a solution for mitigating climate change, or one of the solutions. Um, so just to talk a little bit about numbers, we heard from Travis and others that organic producers are afraid of being swamped by other producers <laughs> coming into organic. Well, we're a long ways from that in the prairie. Even if you count Travis's 40,000 acres, we're a long way uh, from having a, a lot of acres. Um, and although organic acreage has grown rapidly in the past three years, to put it in context, we're barely back to where we were before the recession. In fact, we have not gotten there yet in Manitoba in terms of recovering the number of organic producers that we had in 2008. So it's a long road back, um, but we're getting there. So we have 117,000 organic acres in Manitoba and 3.2 million acres in Canada. Just to put that in perspective in little old Manitoba, this is where organic, the one in red, and this is all organic crops, including fruits and vegetables and plow downs. Um, it ain't that small um, when you're talking to policy folks at Manitoba Agriculture because there's more overall acres of organic whatever than there is for sunflower seeds or dry beans or rye or fodder corn. So think about it that way when you're trying to make an impression. Yes, we're not canola, but we'll get there. Um, so the top graph here shows you the number of producers in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba um, between 1999 and 2017, the green line shows you the number of acres. The downslide there is the economic recession. Organic is very susceptible to um, world economic conditions. The first thing that goes when you feel fearful about your livelihood is expensive food especially expensive processed foods. You might continue to feed your baby organic milk, but you stop feeding your husband anything organic. <laughs> um, so what you can see from the green bar is that acres have been less susceptible to uh, the recession than were producers. So what the bottom graph shows is farm size. And this one I completely blame on Travis. <laughs> His data wouldn't be in here yet. But you can see the average farm size in 1999 in organic was less than 400 acres prairie wide. Now we're getting close to 1,200 acres, which is still small from a conventional perspective, but definitely big for organic. 
Um, and that's because, the, um, as you can see from the top graph, we've lost producers, but we didn't actually lose all that many acres. So that meant when a producer retired from organic, the land usually continued to be managed by another organic producer, so they just got bigger. So I want to tell you quickly, um, if, if, we're, if we want to get into a fear mode of there's too many organic acres out there, I want to show you the data for what's happening globally with cereal grains, pulses, and oil seeds. Um, so you can see this is data from the International Federation of Organic Agriculture that, um, that, that cereal grain production has dramatically increased in a relatively short time. But to keep this in perspective, uh, it's still not all that many acres. Um, so you can see the 2016 acres there. Um, so there's, there's still room to grow. Uh, where are those acres produced? Well, it used to be that we didn't even count China because A, they didn't provide data to anyone, but they kind of snuck in there and went from nothing to everything in probably about three years in terms of organic grain production. So now they're the number one cereal grain producer, but do you need to panic? No, why don't you need to panic? Because they eat everything that they produce, plus they import a whole bunch more. So it's not China you need to worry about. China is the world's largest emerging organic market. They have real true fear of food. They are afraid of being served I don't know, rocks in their flour, whatever. Um, they're fearful of it. They're turning to organics in a very big way. So even though the 30% of the production, they are a net importer of organic grain. Uh, Italy is second. Do you need to fear them? No, why not? Because they make pasta. <laughs> so they're a huge importer of germ pasta from from the prairie region and other regions. The US, do we need to worry about them? No, they're a massive importer of organic food. They account for more than half of the world's organic market. They eat 59% of everything organic that the world can produce. They need more of it. Canada, do we need to worry about us? Yeah, a little bit. Um, we, the, the, on this slide, the ones that our exporters are Canada, Ukraine, Turkey, Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan, Turkey, and Ukraine have come out of absolutely nowhere. And in Canada as a producer, and if you're growing wheat, this is your competition. This is what is arriving in boats in Eastern Canada at um, rates that you cannot compete with. Landed will be, I don't know, 15 bucks or something for Red Spring Wheat that's landed in Montreal. Um, lower quality than Canada, um, but I did hear something super scary from one of the grain buyers that I talked to, and that is that there is a mill, an organic mill based in Ontario, that uses no Canadian hard red spring wheat. Everything that it uses comes landed from one of those three countries on the top. So that I find the scariest thing about this. Um, switching to pulses, there's not that much overall pulse production, but you can see that it is greatly increasing. And that's all pulses. Where do they come from? They come from France and Canada. It makes you wonder why Roquette bothered to move to Canada. All the pulses are back home in in France, and 11% of them are in Canada. Um, the US is a very small player. Oil seeds. Um, this is 50% soybean. What are soybeans used for organically? We'll see in some future slides. 
They are used to feed chickens in America. Um, America has something like a, last year when I went to a, a show in St. Louis, they had a two million acre deficit in corn and soy in America, and it's because of those damn chickens. This is where uh, the oil seeds are growing, and you can see that Canada is not as big a player. And the primary reason for that is we don't have the heat units to grow soybeans in the, in the prairie region. We're starting to grow a little bit, but it's small. Um, this is just to show you from Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Canada what we're exporting, and this is just what stats can tracks, and we don't have any that many um, HS export codes yet. I can tell you I don't really believe the first two numbers, the lentils and yellow peas, because if you add them up, those export numbers exceed the number of acres that we've planted in those crops. So it means that Stats Canada or the grain traders are counting some of their, it, it's up to grain traders to choose the right box. And so I think they're counting conventional in there. But the other data makes sense to me. Um, so you can see that Durham wheat is a very big export crop. So despite the fact that you band together in your farmer union, Travis, there are some, there are some factors that are completely outside of your control. Um, and that has to do with, you know, the decisions that other grain buying companies make and what one grain buyer that I talked to called the commoditization of organic. And basically what that is, is it's a race to the bottom. So who can get there the fastest in terms of price? And that example of that Ontario company that only buys grains from Eastern Europe is an example of that race to the bottom, that price is the only factor that matters. And I don't know what the solution for that is. Possibly it's the end user of the grains because I know that there are some grain companies that only use Canadian organic grains. Uh, for example, La Milanese in Quebec, they buy from Quebec. When they run out of those grains, they come to Manitoba and they're in the process of scaling up organic wheat in Manitoba. The reason they do that is they want quality and they produce those kind of artisanal products that demand very high quality. So it's not always a race to the bottom, but that's definitely a, a factor. Um, the other issue is these kind of internecine trade wars that are happening between different countries. You know, I heard recently of a bunch of pulse producers in northern Alberta had a grain company walk away from their contract. And that happened because they were buying to export to China. And that happened because America whacked a bunch of grain tariffs on China. Um, so, so there's just a bunch of things that are outside of your control no matter what you do. And it's because organic is a small player in a big world. Um, I'm not so worried about the, the more acreage thing because no matter how many more acres we get, the market is growing faster than that. What the sense that I have gotten from talking to the grain buyers is that the lull that we're seeing right now and that may well last until late spring or early summer has to do with overbuying on the part of, of food processors. And as near as I can figure, that happened because last spring, if you remember, we didn't get any rain, we didn't get any rain, and we didn't get any rain. What does that do for a buyer? It creates fear. What does fear do for a buyer? It makes them want to fill up their bins. So they filled them really full, and they're still full. But even though that's happened, the consumer market is getting bigger and bigger all the time. So at some point, those bill those bins are gonna empty out and they will buy again. So this is where I want to allay some of the fear in the room. 
that yes, the market has subsided in terms of both demand and price, and maybe that price thing is here to stay, but uh, for sure the demand thing has not gone away because the overall conditions uh, would indicate that the buyers are there and the economic conditions that support those buyers are still healthy. Canada's not in a re recession, nor is it near one, despite what we think. Um, so this is our historical trade. I mentioned Western Europe used to be a big deal. Uh, it's not anymore, and it's because of glyphosate, or so they say. Um, the US, are, they are still, are probably our major organic market. And in fact, there are many organic grain traders that have offices in Saskatchewan that are this, just there to crank up grains to send back home to feed the chickens. Um, and Asia, the demographic has changed there. Our market used to be Japan, so we signed a bilateral agreement in organic with Japan. But now the market, I think it's a general fear of food in Asia has spread from China to all of Asia. So you'll see Malaysia, uh, Singapore, Taiwan, South Korea are all becoming huge markets for organic. And those people are coming over to Canada to shop for grains. So this is just to give you an idea of where you should be looking. Right now we have some challenges with Asia, but those are temporary, I think. Um, this is just an example of what we call bilateral equivalency arrangements. Those are negotiated country to country and they are organic agreements. So what they are meant to do is make it a hell of a lot easier for Travis to sell his grains into Singapore. No, not Singapore. We don't have a trade deal with them, but anywhere Japan, let's say. In the old days, you go to your certifying body and they would have required you to check a box for the countries you want to trade to and then you actually have to pay to get inspected to the standards of those countries. Equivalency throws all of that out the window. You check one box now and you're in all those countries for which we have relationships. And we have five of them. And then if you couple that together with the Canadian governments, broader trade agreements, CETA to Europe and TPP to Asian Pacific countries, you have a lot more easy access to trade, she says, without ever having sold a grain in her life. Um, <laughs> so, right now I'm just gonna go really quickly through some price data, and these data happen to come off the Pivot and Grow website, but I think originally they were probably data that I collected. Um, so this shows you conventional and organic milling and feed wheat. So the top line is, is you see from 2012 to 2018, there's a lot of fluctuations in the organic market, and that fluctuation is re that dynamic is really related to the size of the market. You get one buyer in organic who wants a whole lot of hard red spring wheat when you've only got this much and you have someone who wants this much, you get a huge perturbation in the market. Um, that doesn't happen in the conventional world because it's exponentially larger and it can withstand those shocks. Um, so the top graph shows you the month-by-month -month breakdown for 2018 for f milling wheat at the top and feed wheat in the blue line. And then the bottom graph shows you the price differential between organic and conventional, and we call that the organic premium. And you can see that for hard red spring wheat and feed wheat, that premium's pretty good. That dotted line at the 100 mark right there would on the bottom graph would represent the conventional price. So you can see that no matter what happens in organic, 
<laughs> you always have, a, so far since the recession, you have a, a premium and that premium will vary. But for hard red, it rarely goes below 150, which means a 50% premium over conventional, which is decent. Um, and you can see that on the top graph, at the start of this year, we started off with $21 a bushel hard red spring wheat milling wheat, and by the end of the year, we're at 17. One farmer told me today about a bid of 14, but that's an outlier. If you're, if you're a good marketer, you should be able to get $17 these days. I'm not gonna go into this because Roy talked about cost of production, but this slide is here just to show you that cost of production is not just a production tool, it's a marketing tool. So what that tells you is how many bushels you need at any given price or what price you need at any given yield. So depending, usually you know one of those two things, what the market price is or what your yield history is. And then from that, you can figure out what you need to break even. And as Roy says, our goal is not to break even. It's actually to pay ourselves and have a, a happy family life, which involves making your payments to your house and all that stuff. Um, flax. So you can't see it very well, but there's a yellow line at the top, and that's yellow flax. And of all the commodities I've watched over the seven years I've been in Manitoba, I have to say that yellow flax is the craziest. And, and this is because it's a super niche, small market thing. And we have had years where Chinese buyers have completely changed the dynamic so that we've gotten $60 a bushel for yellow flax. But then there's been periods where you can't sell this stuff. Maybe that Chinese buyer doesn't want it anymore. So it's just a really small market phenomenon. Um, conventional flax has always had a, a decent premium. Uh, I mean, organic flax has always had a, a decent premium. You can see the difference because conventional is on the bottom, just over $10 a bushel. Um, right now, you could probably expect $36 a bushel for brown flax, um, but it was sitting at 38 for the last four years. Um, you see that better on this graph, and you see the premium on the bottom. This is yellow peas. I only put this one on because there's lots of talk about yellow peas these days, but um, so far, not that many Manitobans have been growing them. But you can see uh, versus some of the other grains, it's been steadier. Um, and if you ever want to know the market price for anything, just call Al McKenzie. He told me <laughs> the price for these today, and it's better than what's on here. So overall, I've kind of alluded to this. Um, normally, there's a big uh, organic buying spree after Christmas. It didn't happen this year, striking fear into the hearts of the people in this room um, because of overbuying. Um, but don't panic. So that's, that is my message. Um, unless um, you absolutely can't hold on to your grain, I recommend that you do that especially if it's wheat, because one thing we know about organic wheat is it may take longer to sell, but it always sells. So that's why bin capacity is so important. <laughs> um, here are the things that for sure you can sell. I never make recommendations anymore after a horrible quinoa experience I have in my not too distant past. Uh, I won't tell you what to grow, but I can tell you what I think is going to sell. Um, so wheat is always in demand. I know of at least two new companies that are specifically focused on Manitoba. Because when I went to a trade show about four years ago, I think it was Ciel Montreal. 
I talked to a major buyer, and they were buying all of their hard red spring wheat from Saskatchewan. I said, yeah, no, Manitoba is one province closer to Quebec. And the guy said, Manitoba, okay. And then they've been buying here ever since. Now they're hiring someone to be based in Manitoba to crank up and aggregate the supply. Feed grains, I'm going to talk about that more. You all hate feed grains because that's just what you get when things don't work out, right? Yellow peas, uh, we keep hearing about them. Um, and maybe the demand won't be here tomorrow, and maybe it won't be here next year, but someday there's going to be big demand for yellow peas. So, so don't plant them tomorrow, but keep an eye on that one. Um, this is just to show uh, the feed demand that's coming out of America. Um, so the left graph shows that 41% of their animals are chicken. Um, it, the beef herd in Canada and the U.S., organic beef herds have declined. I was talking to our major organic beef producer the other day and he says, the market has not declined, but we just have not been able to capture the market because we don't have the right marketers. So if you're a marketer, there's, a, there's an opportunity. This slide is just to show you, um, this is the, the number of broiler chickens that were slaughtered in the U.S. in the last three years. The yellow bar is the last three months of 2018. Um, so every year for the last three years, um, broiler slaughter has gone up. And we also have laying hens that aren't considered here. And if I can remember the number, something like 53.5 million broilers were slaughtered in America in a one-year period in 2017. Add to that another 11 million laying hens on any given day. That adds up to 500 million bushels of soybean. But guess what? Yeah, we don't grow that. But chickens will eat anything, and Americans are figuring that out. So what they are doing is trying to figure out an alternative diet that includes other grains, like wheat is, is in big demand, peas, barley. Um, so that's an opportunity. This slide just shows you that we actually have some organic food processors in the province. Call one of them and chat and see what their needs are next year. Um, in conclusion, my biggest comment, if you don't have bin space, go out and get some, be patient, and maybe don't grow that super, super niche cro crop unless you've already lined up a market. You know, don't go out and plant 300 acres of echinacea unless you have a market for 300 acres of echinacea. Um, and also, Set your target price on the current market, not on that $25 a bushel wheat that was here a couple of years ago because that has been and gone and never coming back, unless there's a farmer union, then maybe. <laughs> and that's it. Any questions, you can call me. Uh, I just want to put a plug in for our events this afternoon in the Upper Curling Club. Um, it's all industry stuff, so if you're organic, I really hope you're going to be there because we're going to be talking about a new initiative to fund uh, the organic sector and bring in more farmers and flood out your organic prices. No, I'm kidding about that. Um, but I hope you'll be there because we need to hear from you. So that's Upper Curling Club starting at 1, and if you've already signed up for lunch, we'll see you there. Um, starts in a few minutes. Um, we're sold out if you don't have a ticket. Thank you all for your patience. <laughs>